Excitement is building around Apple's transition from Intel to its own CPU designs, and we're not far away from the release of the first Apple Silicon Mac. And so many are wondering what the software support will be like. What apps are going to be available at launch, and will we be missing some key applications? Naturally, Apple has been working on its own suite of software, and it's got the big players like Microsoft and Adobe on board. But what about the other apps that people rely upon day after day to do their jobs? Will there be Apple Silicon versions, or will early adopters be left hanging? Let's take a look at the task facing developers and see whether or not we can answer some of those questions. Apple needs to have software developers well and truly on board if this transition is to be successful. But at the same time, they can't leave their fate solely in the hands of third-party developers. And this is why Apple has created a suite of tools to make the process of developing for Apple Silicon much simpler. Many macOS software developers are already using the development tools that Apple provides, and primarily this is the Xcode application, which includes a code editor and user interface design tools, amongst other things. Xcode is already a one-size-fits-all for Apple products. You can use it to develop apps for macOS, iOS, iPadOS, watchOS, and tvOS. But historically, the mobile operating systems are distinct from macOS. But now it will be possible to migrate iOS and iPadOS apps over to macOS. Of course, you will also be able to run any iPhone or iPad app on your Apple Silicon Mac. But developers will likely want to optimize their mobile apps for the desktop. And the new tools that Apple has provided will allow developers to do just that. And that's good news. We can expect lots of mobile apps to start becoming available as macOS apps. And this alone will fill many gaps in the casual consumer app space. And if you can't find an app, it may be that you can just use a mobile version. True, it probably won't be a great desktop experience using iPad and iPhone apps that haven't been optimized, but it's a nice option to have in a pinch. The main challenge for developers is the redeveloping and optimizing of their code for a completely different CPU architecture. Ordinarily, this would be a big hurdle for software developers, but again, Apple is simplifying this process. All of the tools and the code APIs that have existed for years within Xcode can be used for both Intel and Apple Silicon. When the app is compiled, two versions will be produced, one for Intel and one for Apple Silicon. And these will be bundled together as a universal binary. Your computer will just run the version that's appropriate for your system. We could illustrate this process of developing once for two different systems in this way. Suppose I've got a document written in English, which I would like to share with one person who only speaks French and another person who only speaks Arabic. Instead of learning those two languages, I could employ the services of a translator who already speaks both French and Arabic. And the translator does the work of translating the document, so I don't have to learn anything new, which is good because my French sucks and my Arabic is non-existent. Um, Apple's development tools are performing the same task. Developers will be able to take their existing code and recompile it for compatibility with both Intel and Apple Silicon. So, it's all sorted then. Not quite. It may be that straightforward for simple apps, but more complex apps will still need some work. And additionally, developers don't always follow code standards, so you can't rely on them having code that is perfectly ready for this process. One of the biggest challenges will be for apps that make use of multi-threading, since Intel and ARM CPU architectures are very different here. So let me explain that in simple terms. Your Intel CPU has multiple cores, effectively multiple CPUs all on one chip. And these cores are all identical in their performance. This is known as symmetric multiprocessing. ARM CPUs, on which Apple Silicon is based, have asymmetric multiprocessing. The cores are not all identical. There are high-performance cores, and there are power-efficient cores. ARM calls this architecture Big Little. And traditionally, an ARM CPU will run on its low-power cores when it doesn't need maximum performance, thus saving battery life, and then it will switch over to the performance cores when it needs to. Apple Silicon will take this design a step further in their Mac-specific CPUs, According to Apple's developer documentation, the operating system will be able to use all the CPU cores, and it will attempt to distribute low-priority tasks to the little cores and high-priority performance tasks to the big cores. This is a good thing, by the way, since it means Apple will be squeezing even more performance out of its already very fast chips. 
Now, to some extent, macOS will be able to determine the performance needs of the code being run, and it will be able to distribute tasks to the appropriate cores. But there's no crystal ball here. The developers need to take the time to properly label the various processes in their apps. Each worker process needs to have QoS, or quality of service, values set. Is it a background process, or is it a process that's critical to user interaction? If the developer properly defines this using the supply tools, then macOS doesn't need to guess, and it can distribute tasks to the appropriate CPU core. And of course, setting these values won't affect the Intel version of the code, since on Intel chips, all the cores are the same. But it could potentially make a big difference on the Apple Silicon version. And great optimization will be key to Apple Silicon's success. So there's some work for developers to do, and it's probably fair to say that not all apps will get properly optimized in time for the launch of Apple Silicon Max. That said, Apple has taken measures to streamline this process for developers. And there's still a backup option, and that's Rosetta 2, a technology that will convert apps compiled for x86 or Intel into ARM or Apple Silicon code. And it does this at the point that the app is installed on the system. So should we worry about software during this transition period? Bear in mind that Apple will target consumer machines before pro machines. The vast majority of consumers will probably have pretty much everything they need straight away. But many pro users who use Apple do so because they work with Apple software, things like Logic Pro and Final Cut Pro. And these apps will be sorted early on. Uh, likewise, Apple said that Adobe are on the case with converting their suite of applications. Of course, there will be gaps, and it probably will be the pro users that suffer if they adopt Apple Silicon early. One key question that is still unanswered is, what will happen with x86 emulation and virtualization? Web developers, for example, need access to virtual machines and container technologies such as Docker. It may take some time to find a workaround for these things, and in the meantime, these pro users will need to stay on Intel Macs. Fortunately, Apple will be supporting Intel for a good while yet. Now that's it for this video. If you enjoyed this content, please consider supporting the channel with just one click of the subscribe button. I really appreciate all of your support, and I also love reading all your comments. So if you've got some thoughts on this issue, please leave a comment below. Maybe I did enough to earn a thumbs up, or a thumbs down if that's your thing. In any case, I'll see you next time for some more geekery.